Our topic today is how to protect assets from Medicaid spend down. My name is Lynn St. Louis, and I am an estate planning and elder law attorney at ELG Estate Planning. And protecting assets against spend down uh, uh, for long-term care costs is a topic that is really something that actually excites me. Uh, it is one of the big concerns that anyone who is facing long-term care has, and that is, how do I avoid losing everything I've worked so hard for over um, my lifetime? So it is a, a really interesting topic, I think, uh, at ELG Estate Planning. This is one of our areas of expertise, is helping clients uh, obtain benefits uh, to pay for their long-term care, Medicaid government benefits, without having to deplete all of their assets. If you have any questions, please uh, put them in the chat if you're joining us Zoom live. And if you are on Facebook, go ahead and uh, put those questions in and we will um, answer them hopefully by the end of our uh, talk today. So it's just about the top of the hour. So I am going to go ahead and get started with how to protect assets from Medicaid spend down. Oh, and one of the things that I think it's really important that everybody understand, whether you're viewing this live with me or later on on our YouTube channel, is I am talking about Washington law. I am not talking about law in Oregon or Idaho or California or anywhere else in our country. Every state has different rules when it comes to Medicaid and Medicaid eligibility. Uh, yes, Medicaid is a federal program, but every state takes and makes it uh, their own. So please don't take what I am saying today and saying, well, I heard Lynn say this on how to protect assets from Medicaid spend down. It works in my state. What I'm talking about only works in your state if you are a resident of Washington. So first of all, what we're gonna talk about is basics. How do you pay for long-term care? The majority of people pay for long-term care from their income and from their assets. I would say the overwhelming majority of people don't understand Medicaid and Medicaid's rules and that Medicaid may well pay for your care. You could be eligible for Medicaid but they have heard from friends and from, and I'll get to this, from other sites, uh, websites that say you have to be impoverished to qualify for Medicaid to pay for your long-term care. That's not necessarily the case. And we're going to get into those details. So the majority of people pay for long-term care privately. And that's why they're so concerned that they are going to go broke. Why is that? Because the cost of long-term care easily is $5,000, $10,000, $15,000 per month. And simply doing the math, you can see how it wouldn't take long before the money is gone. What other ways, what other sources are there for paying for long-term care? Well, maybe you have private long-term care insurance. And if so, that is fantastic. What I tell clients that have it, is keep it. When you get that renewal or something from the long-term care insurance company that says, hey, your premium's going up. Why don't you go ahead and reduce the benefits? I say, not necessarily. You maybe want to keep those benefits as they are. Don't go for the reduced premium. Sometimes people have to because it's just financial um, that they can't afford it. But if you have long-term care insurance, that's fantastic. Do keep it. If you don't have long-term care insurance, and if you are living here in Washington state and you are working, you just saw a tax that is a new tax on your paycheck. And that's because of the Washington CARES Act. We'll be talking about that. Washington really is in the vanguard of states with an insurance-based program to pay for long-term care. So think of it, you know, you have Social Security, you have Medicare, you get those benefits when you reach a certain age or if you're disabled because you paid into the system. It is really like an insurance-based program. Medicaid, which is what we're gonna be talking about, on the other hand, is a needs-based program. 
So in order to qualify for Medicaid, you have to meet income and resource limits that we'll talk about. But the Washington CARES Act is an insurance-based program, meaning that your paycheck is being reduced by a certain amount because you are now paying into a brand new system that Washington State has to provide benefits for long-term care. And I have to say, I you know commend the state of Washington for taking on this difficult and absolutely necessary task of figuring out how we're going to take care of our people. Yes, it is a payroll tax. And yes, I totally understand that people feel like they're getting taxed and taxed and taxed, but there is a need and Washington has taken on that challenge. Other ways to pay for long-term care, possibly veterans benefits, especially if the veteran has a service-connected disability that could pay for the long-term care expense. I'm not talking about that beyond what I just mentioned today. One of the biggest misconceptions people have is that Medicare and the insurance-based program, like I mentioned, that it pays for long-term care. Medicare does not pay for your long-term care. It is a program to pay for your hospital, your doctor's bills, not your long-term care. And one of the reasons that people sometimes get confused about it is that maybe they went to the hospital because they broke their hip or had a stroke or something. And then after being in that hospital for that inpatient treatment for at least three midnights, they are released to a skilled rehab facility. And in that rehab facility, kind of feels like a long-term care facility, they are getting rehab to be get, to get better. So under the Medicare program, up to 100 days of rehab is covered, if not fully, fully is for the first 20 days, thereafter it's partial, uh, depending on your insurance supplement program to Medicare. The Medicare program does pay for that rehab. And so that kind of feels like long-term care. And so people are thinking, yeah, Medicare pays for long-term care until they get a notice that Medicare is stopping because of failure to progress or the 100 days has been reached. And now the person, rather than being able to go home, they are still too debilitated and won't be able to go home. So now they have to get uh, long-term care. How, what does that look like? Well, long-term care is usually a different part, maybe of that same facility, and uh, that Medicare doesn't pay for. That is that custodial long-term care is a private pay, is that skilled nursing, it is at least 11, 12, $14,000 a month. And that's when people start to get really freaked out because they thought, that their care was gonna be paid for by Medicare, but instead, now they have realized that out of pocket is over $10,000 a month. What are they supposed to do? It's at this point, oftentimes, that clients reach out to us, and what I want you to know is that at ELG Estate Planning, we are able to assist people at time of need, at crisis. It works a lot better if they have the right kind of estate planning documents in place when they come to us, that regardless, we are able to help people at time of need. And when I say help people at time of need, what am I talking about? I'm talking about Medicaid. How do we help people qualify for Medicaid? Because Medicaid is the government benefit program administered by the state that pays for long-term care. So let's talk briefly about our new Washington CARES Act. And I believe I've got this correct on this uh, uh, on this PowerPoint slide here, that the website for Washington CARES Act is wecareforwacares.org. I could be wrong about that. If you look into that and it's wrong, just Google Washington CARES Act to get the correct website. What I thought was really interesting when I went to that website uh, yesterday was that on the website, it says most of us, 70% will need help with meals, moving around or using the bathroom at some point in our lives. And what that is referencing is that we will need 
long-term care. It doesn't say for how long we'll need it, but it says most of us, 70% will at some time need that kind of long-term care help. So this new program, the Washington Cares Act, provides a lifetime benefit of $36,500. That is the lifetime benefit that you would be entitled to under this program if you have paid into this program for 10 years. So that's 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 a good thing. And it's inflation, it's indexed to inflation. So in 10 years, what will the benefit be? Well, it'll be more than 36,500. Will it be a whole lot more? Depends on inflation, but probably not a whole lot more. And then how is this paid for? 0.58% of every hundred dollars earned. So everything on your paycheck, yeah, that amount 0.58%, so less than 1% goes to pay for this new program. So it is an insurance fund, it's not income tested, it's not resource tested, unlike Medicaid. Another thing that I thought was really interesting and in what's uh, on the slide that I'm sharing with you, it says Medicaid requires near bankruptcy. We are gonna talk about that. That came from the Washington Cares Act website and I am here to help to provide information that that's not necessarily true. For most people, it is true because most people don't seek out the services of an elder law, an estate planning attorney with Medicaid expertise. We at ELG Estate Planning have Medicaid expertise. We know what the rules are, so we know how to help clients so that they're not in a position of near bankruptcy. But I would say for the majority of people who don't seek out um, those services that Medicaid, it's true, Medicaid does require near bankruptcy. But I'm gonna show you how that doesn't have to be true for you. But let's talk about the Medicaid program. Medicaid, as I mentioned, is a state and federal program. And again, we're talking about Medicaid in Washington state, no other state. In Washington, we call it Washington Apple Health. It covers long-term care in nursing homes, skilled nursing facilities, assisted living, adult family homes, and care at home. In order to qualify for Medicaid, you must meet eligibility tests. The tests are medical, income, and resources. Now the medical test is pretty easy to understand. What it means is you need help. You need assistance with two or more activities of daily living, eating, bathing, dressing, transferring, toileting, ambulation, walking, moving around. In addition, even if you don't need help with that, if you have a significant cognitive impairment, Alzheimer's for example, you would meet the medical eligibility test. So I know people wanna talk about Medicaid estate recovery. We will do that. And if there's anything in particular about your particular situation that maybe is best taken offline, I'm gonna give you our information about contacting us. Um, and I'll ask Colleen to put that in the chat right now about our website, elgwa.com and our phone number, which is 509-468-0551. I cannot give specific legal advice here during uh, today's session, but we can um, continue and have a, a chat offline later. So I'm gonna go back to sharing my screen. We just talked about medical eligibility. So let's move on to something that I think is a little bit more confusing, and that's financial eligibility. And when I'm talking about financial eligibility, there are two categories. The first is income, and the second is um, resources. So income is the easier topic. Let's start with that. Financial eligibility income-wise for Medicaid, for skilled nursing program, and you'll see I'm talking about two things. Skilled nursing is one and non-skilled nursing is the other because there's different sets of rules for each. So skilled nursing, basically the income test standard 
is that you have to have less money than the cost of the nursing home. I mean, that's not, there are exceptions, et cetera, but just keep in mind, if you make $20,000 a month income and your nursing home bill is 15, you don't need Medicaid from an income perspective. Now, that's not commonly the case. Commonly, people may have under $5,000 or thereabouts in income and the nursing home is 15. So they're looking at a $10,000 deficit. So yes, in that scenario, person meets the income test for Medicaid. How about non-skilled nursing? Non-skilled nursing involves, these are the primary programs. There's other programs, the PACE program, for example, but I wanna talk about the key programs for Medicaid for non-skilled nursing. That is what we call the COPES program, Community Options Pro Program Entry System. Anyway, COPES is what we call it. So COPES care is for people who aren't in the nursing home, but they are at assisted living, adult family home, or at their own home. Nobody wants to leave their own home and go to a nursing home. So the COPES program actually allows people to bring care into their own home, paid for by Medicaid and receive care in their home. From a practical perspective, I have to let you know that care at home is one of the most uh, problematic to implement. The reason for that in large part is that when Medicaid approves care because you're otherwise eligible, you're eligible, they typically don't approve enough hours. And um, so it's really hard to get care in the home and make it work. It can be done. I'm just saying that it's not the easiest. Care in an assisted living is for somebody who is not quite so um, incapacitated. They just need some help. Care in an adult family home could be that same level of care or heavy duty care, depending on the adult family home and their qualifications. Adult family homes are one of my favorite locations for people to receive care if they need higher level care, because it's a home type situation. And assuming that it's a highly skilled, good adult family home, um, it's, it's a really um, good option for people that need care. Our state is pretty generous in what our income standard is for care at home um, or under the, not at home, but in the adult family home or assisted living or at home, actually. It's $9,440. These standards are what I'm, um, everything you're hearing me say about numbers, if you're looking back at this later, is what you need to know is it is July of 2023. So all of these numbers that I'm talking about right now are standards in Washington state as of July, 2023. So if you have $9,000 worth of income, you meet the income test for our COPES program. There's another program that Medicaid has that's non-skilled nursing, and that's called our Community First Choice or CFC program. The income standards for that program are far lower. For care in home, in order to qualify income-wise for the CFC program, your income has to be 914 or less. For care in a facility-based care, assisted living or adult family home, the um, uh, income limit is basically three times the 914 or $2,742. So those are the income tests for the Medicaid long-term care programs. When I'm saying income, keep in mind, I'm talking about gross income. Gross income includes your social security. It includes any pensions that you receive. That is what we call income. Now, people often confuse their RMDs from an IRA and say that that's their income. We'll be talking about this, but an RMD or required minimum distribution that you get from a retirement account that is your account, your IRA, your 401k, that's actually not considered income because those assets are considered resources and they are considered countable resources. 
So that's what we're going to talk about next is financial eligibility resource. And it says allowance resource standards. What it means is what can you keep for resources and qualify for Medicaid? And what we're talking about right now is what is countable because not all resources are countable. So with Medicaid qualification, what we want to know is what resources do you have and what counts? The Medicaid beneficiary, the person who needs the care, countable resources, all they can have is $2,000. And that's why it is believed that a Medicaid uh, beneficiary must be without assets. Bankrupt is the term that Washington Cares Act use. I would say that they have very low resources if they are the Medicaid beneficiary in countable resources. One of the things that I'm sure you're going to find confusing and Medicaid can be one of the most confusing areas of um, legal practice because the rules are so non-commonsensical in ways. So interestingly, for some people, and if they need a nursing home care and they have not been on Medicare, they need, they're under 65, there's no resource limit. So yeah, you heard me right. And that makes no sense for a lot of reasons, but it's just how the Affordable Care Act and the MAGI program is set up, but that's an exception. Keep in mind, the rule that I want you to understand is that a Medicaid beneficiary can only have 2,000 and countable resources. We'll talk about what else they can have that doesn't count in a moment. But if you are a couple, part of a couple, and your spouse needs long-term care, you are in a far different situation than if you are a single person who could only have 2,000 because Washington and the Medicaid program has a policy against impoverishing the community spouse, the well spouse. What that means is there is what's called a resource allowance for the community spouse, for the spouse who doesn't need care. The minimum resource allowance in Washington state is $68,000. $301. So the Medicaid's, the community spouse can have $68,000 in the bank, for example. Not a ton of money, but way better than $2,000. And if the Medicaid uh, spouse beneficiary is in the nursing home, the person, the, medic, the community spouse, the one at home who doesn't need care, can keep up to $148,620. So there's different standards. Remember when I was talking earlier about skilled nursing versus COPE's care, COPE's being not skilled nursing, there's different rules uh, with regard to resources that apply to these different programs. So the COPE's program is a program for non-nursing home care for assisted living, adult family home and at home care. The COPE standards for what the community spouse, the well spouse can keep is $68,301. If the ill spouse is in the nursing home, the well spouse can keep up to $148,620. How does that work? In our state, Washington says you can keep up to that amount, but only if when the ill spouse started receiving care at the hospital or at the skilled nursing facility or wherever they entered the care system, that the resources of the couple that are countable exceeded double of the 148. I don't make up these rules. These are just the rules. In other words, let's say that as the time at the time the ill spouse went into care, the couple had 400,000 in bank accounts and retirement accounts, etc. Okay, because that all counts. They had 400,000, that's more than double of 148. Therefore, the couple, the well spouse can keep 148,000. But in order to get on Medicaid, the excess resource between 148 and 400 has to be spent down or converted to non-countable. We'll talk about how. Let's say it wasn't 400,000 that the couple had. 
it was 200. How much does the community spouse get to keep as their community spousal resource allowance? Half of 200 or 100,000. Let's say they only had 100,000. How much did they get to keep? They get to keep the 68,000. So confusing rules. I'm sharing it with you to hope that you get a sense that the community spouse does get to keep some money, but it is dependent on how much money they had when the ill spouse went into skilled nursing, if that's where they go. One of the things also that people don't understand is that once the community spouse gets their community spousal resource allowance, let's say it's 148,000 and their spouse is on Medicaid in the skilled nursing facility, thereafter the community spouse, what they have in their name can increase. It can go to 200,000 or beyond. It doesn't matter what the community spouse's uh, amount of resources is once their spouse has qualified for Medicaid. So let's say they play the lotto and they get $100,000 winnings. Great. They can keep it. Does not in any way uh, interfere with their spouse's care benefits. Also, what's important to understand, um, and it's not on the slide, so I'm going to stop sharing, is that the community spouse, I say community spouse, well spouse, I say them interchangeably, they mean the same thing. Their income, whatever their income is, in Washington state does not have to contribute to their spouse's care costs. So it's their income, community spouse, it's their income. It doesn't go to pay for their spouse's care. The only income that pays for the spouse's care is the spouse's, the sick spouse's income. And what, what their income doesn't cover for their care, Medicaid covers the rest. So those are important rules to understand that uh, it's really important because that protects the community spouse from becoming impoverished, exempt resources. So start from the um, premise that everything counts in terms of resources, mm -hmm. countable, and then let's back out what doesn't count. The main uh, resource that most people have that doesn't count is their home, which is huge that the community spouse doesn't have to lose their home. For a single person, their home is an exempt resource, yes, and they can have over a million dollars of equity in their home. Uh, the highest level allowed right now, which is what is in Washington state, is $1,033,000 in equity, which is really important, especially on the west side of our state where home values are so high. A single person can have over a million dollars in equity and that's an exempt resource. We'll talk about Medicaid recovery for a couple, very easy to avoid Medicaid recovery in Washington state by simply transferring assets into the name of the well spouse, the community spouse. For a single person, those transfers aren't so easy. Usually that results in problems. So a single person's home typically is subject to the state's lien for Medicaid recovery. We'll talk about how to avoid it, but as a general rule, a single person's home will be subject to a state recovery. What else is exempt? A vehicle, just one, not two, one vehicle. And that vehicle is to be used to transport somebody to doctor's appointments, or it can be used for that. It can be a very expensive vehicle. It can be a $100,000 vehicle and it's exempt. There's no limit on the value. It just has to be the vehicle that is can be used to transport to medical care appointments. What else? Personal property, unlimited personal property all the jewelry and stuff in the house and uh, and ex anything personal property is completely exempt then we have the next exempt resource on this slide which is life insurance not any life insurance though life insurance policy that has a face value of fifteen hundred dollars or less that's really hard to find something that is so small so that's really not a helpful exempt resource category for us. Also exempt is um, burial, 
plans, cremation plans, as long as they are what we call irrevocable. If you have a revocable one and we're working with a client for Medicaid eligibility, say go back to the funeral home or where you purchased it and say it needs to be irrevocable. It's not a problem to get it irrevocable. Business property, which kind of can of worms to open. Business property means like maybe the person going on Medicaid, they own a small business, they and their spouse do, and it's totally what they rely upon for their income. That's actually an exempt resource. So that's a planning opportunity or an opportunity to protect assets for sure. Long-term care insurance partnership policy. That's a particular kind of long-term care insurance. I believe anything sold in the state currently would fit the criteria for being eligible. But let me give you an example of how it works. Let's say you're a single person and you have a long-term care insurance partnership policy that has a lifetime benefit of a hundred thousand dollars. So when you go to qualify for Medicaid, you can keep not just two thousand in countable resources. You can keep a hundred and two thousand because you had the foresight to buy a policy that paid for your care up to a hundred thousand in my example. So you get to keep a hundred thousand more than anybody else that didn't have such a policy. So that's a. a can be a planning opportunity if you have that type of policy. And then probably one of the most powerful planning tools that we have is what's called the single premium immediate annuity. It's also called a Medicaid compliant annuity. This is an annuity that no one has as part of your financial package, unless you are right now seeking to qualify for Medicaid. Why is that? Because it's not the normal annuity, the normal annuity that you know um, you buy because it provides you guaranteed income for the rest of your life, so you're never going to run out of money. No, the Medicaid compliant annuity, the SPIA, is in Washington state, it is one where typically this is how it's, well, I'll talk about how it's used in, in my example, but the key thing with a Medicaid annuity is that the state is the next beneficiary after the person who bought it. So that is a really odd situation for an annuity. That's why I'm saying you don't have that annuity unless right now, or you have qualified um, for Medicaid. Okay, let's talk about how do you reduce your countable resources? Pretty much we're talking about money. So how do you reduce them. I'm not saying you spend them all down to your poor. I'm saying, how do you do a smart spend down that makes sense? Well, one of the ways to do that is that you will take excess money and you'll invest it in a home equity. You got a mortgage, pay it off. $100,000 extra uh, is countable until you put it on your $100,000 mortgage, you pay off your mortgage. And now you have uh, your house is worth more, higher equity, and you have less money that in the bank. So it doesn't count against you. You can always buy a new car. You can buy other things, material items, personal property. That's fine. Of course, pay for legal services to help you with this. Pay for caregiving services. Um, if you're paying for caregiving services for a family member, somebody who's your caregiver, there are pretty strict rules that apply. You can't just say, oh, my daughter's taking care of me for the last 10 years there. I'm going to go give her 100000 That does not work. But if your daughter, your son, or whomever is caring for you and the your physician has said, you know, they need care, and here's reasonable care and you pay for care is delivered and the care is paid for within 30 days of delivery of the care, then that's an appropriate spend down item. Uh, caregiving is something, if you're in a situation where you or you're providing care to a family member, see an elder law attorney, make sure that you're meeting this criteria because it's an important way to keep money in the family. Transfer of asset rules. I'm sure everybody is familiar with this who's listening. And many of you are saying, yeah, it's a three year look back, right? Well, it was up until 2006. Now it is a five year look back. So for many years, it's been five years. Basically the five year look back rule says is that whatever you do five years of advance of applying for Medicaid, 
Medicaid doesn't care about. It's beyond the time horizon that concerns Medicaid. So if you know, for example, that you have a diagnosis of Alzheimer's and you want to make sure that the family legacy property, the family farm, whatever it may be, isn't interfering with your eligibility for Medicaid benefits or won't be subject to a state recovery, you can transfer it out of your name. Just do it five years before you need care. That works. And there are many occasions when we have helped our clients with what we call five-year look-back transfers. Uh, they can be outright, they can be to an LLC, they can be to a trust, the transfer, the mechanism for receiving the asset is dependent upon your situation. But the rule to keep in mind is whatever you do, five years before applying for Medicaid, that's fine. Just make sure you get good legal advice as to the consequences of what that transfer is, tax consequences, et cetera. Okay, so let's say that you didn't realize that you needed to make this transfer of assets. And so you don't have five years, you're needing care sooner, or your family member is. If you give away assets, Medicaid um, has pretty severe consequences for doing that unless you do it as part of a strategy. So the rule is, as of today, that if you gave away or you give away $11,076, that there's going to be a one month penalty period. It's also called a period of ineligibility. What that means is Medicaid's not going to provide any benefits for one month for every 11,000 you give away. Thus, if you gave away 150,000, then that's a 13 and a half month penalty period. The kicker with this, the really important thing to realize is you just can't give away your money and the penalty period starts to roll. That's how it used to be not now. The penalty period for that gift doesn't start to run until you are otherwise eligible. That means, for example, if you're a single person, you have less than 2,000 in countable assets. You apply for Medicaid. You need care. Your income qualifies. And the really important thing for a single person is that money you gave away cannot be used to cover your care during this 15 month period of an or 13 month period of ineligibility. I'm assuming you gave away 150,000. So there's, it's, it's difficult to start the penalty period running, especially for a single person without other really good strategies in place. So there must be another source of money to pay for your care during the period of ineligibility. I'm going to stop sharing for a moment before we get into some really interesting strategies that are available. Exempt resources apply to the couple. So one of the things, so I want to kind of take off on this question, which is do the exempt resources apply to the sick spouse, the well spouse, or both of them? In Washington state, we are a community property state. So sometimes people say, you know what? I know my spouse needs care, but my spouse doesn't have much in the way of money. Everything, maybe it's a second marriage. Everything in this marriage is mine and it's my separate property. So we're good, right? Medicaid's going to provide care for my sick spouse because my sick spouse doesn't have anything. No, Medicaid says, oh, you are a married couple. What do you both have? Regardless of whether it's community property or separate property, regardless of whether you have a prenuptial agreement that says everything is well spouses, it doesn't matter. The state looks at it and the state says, well, you don't comply with the resource standard, therefore no Medicaid. This really causes people to be quite upset if it's a second marriage, they have a prenup, they did everything right when it came to their estate planning and protecting their assets against divorce and you know inheritance not going where they didn't want it to go, et cetera. But they didn't think about long-term care because it doesn't matter whose name it is, state cup counts the assets of the couple, period. I will talk about how you avoid uh, the state having a lien on that couple's assets once the ill spouse is on Medicaid, which basically means put all the assets into the name of the well spouse and avoid estate recovery. The institutionalized spouse's income is the income that has to pay for care costs. That's true. If the institutionalized spouse was the primary 
breadwinner. So that sounds like they have all the income coming to them and the community spouse, maybe they have low social security, no pension, et cetera. Um, you know, that seems inequitable. You're correct. It does seem inequitable because the community spouse, the one who's supposed to not be impoverished and gets to keep money, well, the ill spouse is the one that had all the income. So all their income is going to pay for their cost of care. That's true. Medicaid has thought this through though. So there is a solution. Let me tell you what the solution is. So Medicaid says that if you are the community spouse, let's say all you get is a thousand dollars worth of social security, you know, because the breadwinner had all the money in income wise and the big social security and the big pension. Well, Medicaid says you get to keep more than just your thousand. The minimum, it's called the minimum monthly maintenance income standard, say that several times fast, is $2,465. So under my example, the community spouse gets to take and have allocated to them an extra $1,465 to get them to the minimum. If there's an ability to show that that community spouse needs more, maybe they're paying off a mortgage or they have other things that require more money, then they can have 3,716. So again, under my example, all they had was a thousand coming to them in their own name. They get to take from their spouse who's in the skilled nursing or wherever, $2,716. So there is an opportunity to redirect income from the ill spouse to the community spouse. That helps, it might not be the best solution, but at least it is some way to help the well spouse keep some money. And then one of the questions here is, is this why you hear about elderly couples filing for divorce? You know, we have here at ELG Estate Planning done Medicaid work for over 17 years. And I can, and we have done literally hundreds, I can't say thousands, because Medicaid is, you know, not as common as just estate planning, but we have done hundreds of Medicaid plans and Medicaid applications. Not once have we ever recommended to a client to get a divorce. Why? Because there's better planning opportunities that exist. I'm not saying that divorce doesn't happen, and I can think of scenarios where a divorce might be the right thing for that couple to protect assets. Through a divorce, you can get what's called a quadro, uh, qualified domestic relation order that says all the assets of this couple are the community spouse, not the Medicaid spouse, because they're ill and it's just going to go to their care. I can think of reasons why it might be appropriate. So don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that never will there be a Medicaid divorce case in our firm. We just haven't had that scenario. Um, and I'll explain why in a moment that we're able to protect the couple and their assets and keep their money. Another reason, and you know, this is something that, you know, I saw it in my own parents, I've seen it in others. They've been married 50 years. That just doesn't feel right to them to get a divorce. And so there's a lot of understandable resistance to a divorce for a long married couple. Okay, let's go back to the screen share. So what we're getting into now is some examples of strategies and transfers that cause no period of ineligibility. And I know we've only got 10 minutes to the top of the hour. So I might be running long. Um, if I do, I apologize. I, I think I said earlier that this is things that I really enjoy sharing with you because I want you to see that you have opportunities that most attorneys don't know. Even some elder law attorneys don't practice in Medicaid, so they don't understand these opportunities that exist to protect assets. So I apologize in advance if I go long, I will try to go a little faster here. So a gifting example, let's say the cost of care is $5,000 a month. The person's income is 3,000. So they're short $2,000 a month. Let's say they have assets of 200,000. So all they can keep is 2,000. So they have to gift $198,000 to qualify for Medicaid. Penalty period on that, just using the divisor of $11,076. It's going to be just about 18 months, 17.88 months. During that period of time, the cost of care deficit, which is 17.88 times 2,000 is 
$3,760. So if we can do this gift, and if we can figure out a way that somebody covers the cost of care during this 17, 18 month penalty period, we can preserve assets of $164,240. That gets us thinking, how can we do this? What can we do uh, in terms of how do you do it? Let's say, you know, one of the family members has ample resources to cover, you know, $33,000. Then maybe we'll file a Medicaid application and do a declaration of one of the family members that says, I'm not even receiving that gift. It's not coming to me. You know, it's coming to my siblings. I have enough money to pay for mom's care to get her through. I have 33000 or plus in the bank. By doing that, the Medicaid application should be approved and we protected $164,000 for the family so that this person didn't have to spend down all their money. Now, if that rubs you the wrong way, I totally get it. If you believe, no, they should pay for their care, that's your decision. My job as the elder law attorney is to tell my clients what options exist, not to tell them what they should do. My job also is to tell people, hey, there are transfers that cause no penalty. Again, we talked about beyond the five-year look back window. You can transfer your home if you transfer it to the right person, your spouse, of course. We do that to avoid estate recovery. You can transfer your home to your disabled child. Your disabled child doesn't have to be somebody that has um, you know, special needs. It could be to your son who had a back injury, so he can't work. You can transfer your home to a sibling, assuming that they had an equity interest for more than a year. You can transfer your home to a caregiver child. They provided care to you for two years in your home. And because of that, you didn't need to go to a facility. And that there's a very specific rules that have to be met. For example, there can't be a private pay period that, uh, creates problems with the caregiver child transfer. But these are transfers that we think about, what can we do to preserve your assets? You can also transfer assets to a trust for a qualified beneficiary, that would be a disabled child or a disabled person under the age of 65. And there are transfers that are made after the person is on Medicaid as well. We'll talk about that. And there's also the CFC program, the Community First Choice program that I told you about that has that lower income threshold. If you do transfers under that program, there's no transfer penalty, even though it was made the month before you applied for Medicaid. So it's it's a really unique option that we sometimes use to transfer assets without uh, creating uh, a period of ineligibility so that the person can receive benefits at their adult family home, for example, and they transferred all their assets there was no penalty and it works. The issue with uh, transfers under the CFC program is if that person's care needs increase since such that they go over to skilled nursing, uh, they're under a penalty period for skilled nursing. So you have to look at this very carefully. Oh, and that's one of the things I wanna say, and I hope you hear me, don't do this on your own. If anything, the takeaway is, hey, there's options, but I understand it's complicated. So none of these things should be done on your own unless potentially it's a five-year look back and you've talked to your accountant and your financial advisor and hopefully your estate planning lawyer too. But be very careful of doing any of this on your own. Once somebody is on Medicaid, they don't get to keep any money. They get to keep $100. That's it. That's an increase from uh, a month ago, but they get to keep $100 and then they always must have under $2,000 in countable resources. If it's a couple, the community spouse will transfer all assets over to them. We do that via separate property agreement and a quick claim deed on the house. The house goes in their name, all bank accounts, everything goes into their name. Why? Because if we do that, then the state gets zero when the Medicaid spouse dies. There is no state recovery. So. It's really important that all assets of the couple be put into the well spouses, the community spouse's name. And we like to do it right away. We don't want to wait. On the death of the Medicaid recipient, the state of Washington will have a lien on whatever's left in their name. And if we did it correctly, if it's a couple, nothing is left in their name. If it is a single person, well, what is usually left in their name? 
probably their house. Let's talk about what I call Medicaid asset preservation strategies. So we're gonna talk about a married couple and we are gonna talk about a single person. Married couples, there are more options. So a married client, here is the example. And here's why I say I like those annuities, those Medicaid compliant single premium immediate annuities. Here is our example. They have an $800,000 stake. That sounds like too much for Medicaid, doesn't it? Because their house is worth 400 and they have 400,000 in a bank account. The house doesn't count. Take that off the balance sheet. The type of care they need is skilled nursing. When I say they, I mean one of the couple. So because it's skilled nursing, they get the community spouse gets to keep the maximum resource allowance, which is $148,000. Well, they've got $251,000 too much. What are we gonna do? Take that $251,000 and you buy the Medicaid compliant annuity. In Washington, how that works is that you take the $251,000, which is countable, you bought the annuity, which is non-countable, they're resource eligible. That money comes back to the community spouse and how it works in Washington is we take the 251, we divide it by 60 months. That's how you get the $4,189 per month comes back to the community spouse. If the community spouse dies before their Medicaid spouse, what happens? Well, we want to make sure we had good estate planning in place such that when the community spouse dies, that the assets of the community spouse don't go outright to the community spouse, if so, community or the Mer Medicaid spouse, excuse me. If it does, the Medicaid spouse has way too much money, they're kicked off of Medicaid. Instead, they have the right kind of estate planning. The will has a supplemental needs trust in it. Because of that, when community spouse dies, all the assets, the house, the bank account, etc., go into a trust allowed by the state for the Medicaid spouse. Medicaid spouse stays on Medicaid. All the assets in the trust are there to enhance any care that's not being provided by the state. And then when the Medicaid spouse dies, none of that money in the trust is subject to a state recovery. And it all goes where the couple wanted it to go for to their children, for example. So that is what I'm talking about. The will has to have the supplemental needs trust in it. If the, if the community spouse had that Medicaid compliant annuity, like we just discussed, then, well, the state allowed you to have that annuity and, and convert countable assets to non-countable, but the community spouse died before the 60 months was up, before they got all their money back. So now what happens? Well, the state of Washington now is the recipient of those monthly payments until any amounts they paid on behalf of the ill spouse are paid back to this the state. It's good if you can live, you know, live as long 60 months to get that money back, but if you don't, that's how it works. It is nonetheless an excellent planning tool for couples. Okay. That's couples and that's how we uh qualify a couple one person of the couple for Medicaid without having to spend down money. If you go to an attorney and they go, oh, I'm sorry, all you got to do is spend, you got to spend down your money. That's not satisfactory. They're not, if they're not exploring options with you and helping you understand what your options are, that's problematic. Okay, let's talk about a single client because single clients are a little bit more difficult. We don't, don't have the spousal resource allowance. We don't use the Medicaid compliant annuity. What are we going to do? Single person. They need adult family home care in my example. That costs $6,000 a month, which is oftentimes what the amount is. Um, sometimes it's more, less, less times it's less, but $6,000 a month cost of care. Income they receive is $3,000. Round numbers are to make this easy. Um, so their cost of care deficit is $3,000 a month. Okay. What do they have for resources? They have a home. It's worth $300,000. And they have a bank account and it's worth 60. So what are we going to do to qualify the single person for Medicaid? One of the most effective strategies we have is remember the home is exempt. You might say, but they don't live in the home, right? No, but we file a notice of intent to return home that renders the home exempt. So now we're dealing with $60,000. What are we going to do? Well, our plan will be to sell the house. 
potentially or improve the house. I mean, there's a reason, put some money into the house, plumbing, roofing, electricity, whatever is needed. Buy a car. Let's say they don't have a car or their car is kind of a beater and they need a better car. Okay, a car is an exempt resource, spend 20,000 on the car, buy an irrevocable prepaid burial plan, spend the rest of the money on good services, legal fees, uh, care fees. So the person is spent down. Once they're spent down, file the Medicaid application, they're on Medicaid. Now what do we do? They're on Medicaid. So we do what we call a half low strategy. It's not exactly that, but that's the terminology we at ELG Estate Planning use. We sell the house. Remember, the single Medicaid person is on Medicaid. We sell the house. If we don't, it's going to be subject to estate recovery. If we sell the house, we have an opportunity to preserve assets. So let's say the house sells for net $300,000. We're going to gift $230,000 and we're going to have the Medicaid client keep 70. We report this. Everything we do is transparent. We tell DSHS, they run the Medicaid program. What have we done? DSHS says, oh, okay, well, you did that. So there, you gave away $230,000. You're going to have a 20 month period of ineligibility off Medicaid, 20 months. What are we going to do? Well, the client retained 70,000. So over the next 20 months, given their cost of care deficit of 3,000 a month, multiply that by 20 months, 20.77. They're going to need 63,000. Okay. That gets them through the period of ineligibility. After that time frame, we reapply, they go back on Medicaid. What happens? They're back on Medicaid. What was the result? The result was that we were able to preserve assets of 230,000 plus the car that we also transferred as well as part of this Medicaid strategy. So for single people, take heart. There are things that can be done to protect assets so that everything you worked for during your lifetime needn't be spent on your care, assuming you get good guidance. All right, so one of the things I wanna make sure that you understand is these strategies do exist. Everybody's situation is different. We at ELG Estate Planning may recommend options and strategies for you to consider, but one thing that we will never do is put these strategies ahead of the person's care. Quality of care is paramount. Everything that we do is to support the care. And if we can protect, preserve assets, we will do so. But never will we put our clients in a situation where the care will be jeopardized. That's really important for me to share with you. I personally, in our family, um, help mom and dad with 14 years of long-term care. And I know that the most important thing for a family is that their loved one's care is appropriate and is not compromised. So I just want to share that with you. In order to do these strategies, we have to have the right estate planning documents. We have to have durable powers of attorney that have gifting authority for couples that also have the ability to do a separate property agreement. When we are working with clients who have very flimsy, weak, old powers of attorney, sometimes our hands are tied and we can't do the things that we would like to do to help the client. So make sure you've got really good durable powers of attorney. And what by that I mean, make sure an elder law attorney did them because an estate planning attorney might say, oh, gifting authority, sure, we'll limit it to the annual exclusion amount of $17,000 per year. That doesn't work. I might need to recommend to the client that they give away $230,000, $17,000. And if the person's lost capacity, I can't do that strategy. All because the attorney who drafted the durable power of attorney did what is very common and traditional from estate planning and doesn't understand elder law because they don't practice elder law and they don't practice Medicaid. Whereas a Medicaid elder law estate planning attorney will make sure those durable powers of attorney have necessary authority in them to do any of these strategies that I've just talked about with you. Wills, I mentioned this before, should have that supplemental needs trust in it to protect assets uh, and preserve government benefits and uh, protect against estate recovery. One other thing about revocable living trust, very common throughout the country. In Washington, not as common, though certainly a revocable living trust might be an appropriate planning platform. Um, but when it comes to Medicaid planning, does not work at all. 
a house in a revocable living trust is no longer an exempt resource, it's exempt. A revocable living trust does not allow us to create that supplemental needs trust on death to protect the assets, uh, to preserve eligibility of the Medicaid uh, spouse, for example, and to protect against you know a, a state recovery. So um, RLTs, revocable living trusts, simply are not a good idea in Washington for Medicaid planning. All right, let me see if we've got any more questions. We've got our contact information there in the chat, uh, elgwa.com and our phone number 509-468-0551. We do have a YouTube channel. And so if you go to our YouTube channel, you'll find lots of information, though today is the most updated on Medicaid. We do have an office in the Seattle area. So if you are interested in King County, please contact us and, and we'll discuss that. Next question, in your half loaf example, what happens to the money from the sale of the house? Typically that money that's gifted is gifted to either a child or children, whomever you'd want to receive your estate when you're gone. Not uncommonly, we'll recommend that it be an irrevocable trust to protect that money in case of divorcing spouses of your children or creditors. Uh, but it usually goes to either outright to whomever you want to receive it or to a trust for those people that we would create that trust at that time. Uh, somebody in Florida had mentioned that um, they don't have experience here, but quality of care doesn't vary much here in Washington, private pay versus Medicaid pay. That's a really good question. You can't tell the difference typically. If you go into a care facility, uh, a Medicaid bed versus a private bed, that's not always true. I'm just saying typically, especially in like an adult family home. Technically, an adult family home, it could be a shared room. Practically, if the person's on Medicaid, practically, they don't have shared rooms. So it's private, it's private, it's Medicaid, it's Medicaid. They're all separate rooms, same facility, same quality of care. But I would be remiss if I didn't say that, yes, Medicaid requires shared if shared is what the standard is at the skilled nursing or wherever. So it may be a shared room in the skilled nursing facility, whether it be a Medicaid or a private pay. I mean, because there are a lot of pri private pay people who select the shared option because they don't want to pay eighteen, seventeen thousand dollars $17,000 a month for the private pay that is a single and not shared. But the point of it is, is that yes, there may be differences, but the quality of care is to be the same regardless of the pay source. Now, there are care facilities, skilled nursing, that don't accept any Medicaid. They're 100% private pay. We're not talking about those. And those are probably more expensive, no doubt. But in skilled nursing in particular, I don't know if the statistic is right, but I, it was at one point. 80% of people in the skilled nursing facilities are on Medicaid. And it's not because they did great plans like we just talked about. It's because they spent all their money and that's their only option. Uh, but particularly with adult family homes, which I mentioned earlier, are, are my preferred route of people need care. An adult family home is just uh, less restrictive, not institutional, great quality of care if you choose the right one. Um, you're not going to see a difference between the um, Medicaid and the private pay. In fact, most adult family homes, and this is important when you're doing planning, they have a two-year private pay requirement anyway. And then after you've met that, you can go on Medicaid. So we work with clients to make sure we satisfy the private pay requirement and then achieve the Medicaid eligibility. All right, I have gone 10 minutes over. Thank you all for sticking with me. I hope you got a lot of really good information from this. If you want more information, feel free to reach out to us, especially those people that had, you know, particular questions today. Um, I'll make sure that I talk with my team about those and um, go to our, our YouTube channel for more information. If you're in the state of Washington, feel free to contact us. If you're outside of the state, I'm sorry, I'm not able to help you, but I do recommend if you're outside of Washington, we do also serve clients in Idaho, but if you're in, in the, any of the other states, go to naela.org. That stands for the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys, naela.org. Otherwise, if you're in Washington or Idaho, we'd be happy to talk with you. Uh, again, I'm Lynn St. Louis with ELG Estate Planning. Thank you so much.